I'm going to talk about WordPress use in the government and specifically the multi-site project that I worked on for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I wanted to share this because I think we're doing a lot of cool things with technology and government right now, specifically using WordPress. And I think it's a great opportunity to talk to you guys about that today and maybe get some high fives and get some community support and spread the word and help encourage the use of WordPress in government. So my name is Sarah Cope. I'm a project manager and developer with the federal government. I also work on CSS Tricks and volunteer with Girl Develop It. And you can find me on Twitter and Slack at Sarah Sasson. The main project I'm going to talk about is one we just finished up for the White House and launched at the end of September this year, and that was the Federal Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Toolkit. And the need for this originated from the second annual um, Open Government National Action Plan, which re was released in 2013, where President Obama called on federal agencies to try and harness the ingenuity of the public by increasing the use of open innovation in methods like citizen science and crowdsourcing and able to try and help solve some scientific and societal problems. And the National Action Plan specifically called for creating an open innovation toolkit for federal agencies to help in the creation and maintenance of open innovation projects. And so before I dive in and talk to you about the website we built, I just wanted to take a quick minute to actually talk about what I mean by citizen science and crowdsourcing and how these are being used in government. Um, honestly, before I started on this project, I didn't know what sci citizen science was, so I thought I'd just take a minute here. Um, and I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with crowdsourcing. It's the idea of distributed problem solving, where you have many hands making light work. Basically, you have a big problem you want to solve, and you call on the wisdom of the crowd to help you come to a solution faster than you could on your own. Um, so all the open source folks out here, I'm sure you've been exposed to that already. And one example of this in the government is the Citizen Archivist Dashboard, uh, which was created by the National Archives. And what they have at the National Archives is just a ton of digital scans of documents. And in order to really get the most value out of those, they need to be transcribed so they can be searched and indexed. Um, so this project, the Citizen Archivist Dashboard, is a website which allows anyone to come and log in, pick a document that you want to transcribe, and add that information to their collection of translated works. So the National Archives, Archives is then able to provide a lot more value from those documents and create some more effective searchable resources with the help of the crowd of folks who are willing to contribute. Went too far. Uh, in citizen science, we use crowdsourcing as a tool to bring in members of the public and have folks participate in scientific projects. This might include collecting and analyzing data, problem solving, or interpretation of results. And a recent project that demonstrates this is the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Um, the monarch butterfly population actually has declined drastically in the past decade. And this project asks people to contribute data by monitoring monarch eggs and larvae and reporting back their findings for scientists who are studying the monarch butterfly to um, help them find out why this decline is happening and how, how we can hopefully prevent it in the future. So hopefully these examples will help you see a little bit how citizen science and crowdsourcing can really help contribute to accelerating our science and technology innovations. Um, and if you want to learn some more about specific projects, you can visit the case studies page on our toolkit website. Sorry, the slides are a little squishy, um, but I'll post them afterwards. Um, and I tweeted out a link to this website this morning. 
Okay, so far I've talked to you about what we wanted to do with the project and why, and now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we did it. To kick off the project, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy worked with the Federal Community of Practice on Citizen Science and Crowdsourcing to plan the project and kick off and gather the goals for the website. Um, and then they started reaching out to the federal community to work on content and development for the site. And this was a very collaborative effort and more than 135 people um, contributed to the project from 25 different federal agencies. And one of the first things they did was a design sprint to do some user research, develop a framework for the information architecture and map out the user journey. And this was done pretty early on. So they also put out a call to the Federal Open Opportunities platform to recruit development staff, and that's how I joined the project. Um, my full-time job is actually with the Department of Veterans Affairs, and I was 20% um, volunteer detailed to this project. Um, so Open Opportunities is basically a federal pin board where agencies can post tasks that they might not have the resources or time to complete themselves. And then federal employees can actually volunteer their time to work on them, basically picking up a task. Um, so this is how I came to join the project. And um, OSTP had actually posted for a WordPress developer, designer, um, content editor, and then eventually we also used open opportunities to pull in some 508 accessibility staff. Um, so the development team was established through open opportunities and none of us had worked before uh, together before or were even in the same location. So starting off, that can be a pretty big challenge for any team. Uh, so then we had a kickoff meeting where leadership said basically, okay, you've got six months because you have to have this done by the end of the fiscal year. Um, you've got no money to spend because there's no budget. Um, and we're working on content, but it's not really done yet. And then they said, you can do that, right? Um, and I was like, sure, it's WordPress. We can do anything. Miracles. Um, but that was before I found out, found out that we actually had to use the multi-site environment. So it got a little tricky. But um, like I mentioned, the goal of the site is to help folks at federal agencies create and sustain citizen science and crowdsourcing projects. Um, so after we kicked off, one of the first things we started doing was some uh, user personas and a little more research, and we went through um, and picked a theme. So some of the restrictions we had as far as picking themes uh, were that we only had about, I think, 15 to 17 to choose from. We can only choose from the themes that were pre-approved by the um, site's development team because of federal restrictions. They all have to be accessible and um, pass security reviews. So um, we had to pick what was available for us. And we ended up going with the WP Enlightened theme by SoloStream. Uh, mainly because it had a lot of page templates and layouts that I thought we could work with. So for the structure of the site, we knew we wanted to use WordPress as a content management system and not as a blog at all. So we used the WordPress post to house all of our case studies that we wanted to show on the site. Um, and we developed a case study overview page so that the users could very quickly see the case studies that we had available. And for this particular page, um, I actually used a widgetized page um, and used a category widgets at the top to display all the categories and then a plugin to display the actual posts and columns. Um, so on the site, we also tried to provide value to the users by giving some step-by-step -step guidance and examples on how folks could start up and run their own citizen science and crowdsourcing projects. And like I mentioned, we use WordPress posts to provide a bunch of case studies so users could see some real-world examples um, with this type of work in government. So back to plugins, we used a number of different plugins to achieve the functionality that we were going for. 
again, we were limited to the plugins in the sites platform that had already been vetted through the security and accessibility reviews. Um, and if you want to see the list of themes and plugins that actually have gone through and have been approved, you can do that on the sites.usa.gov website. You can look under the themes and plugins pages and all that information is listed there. So for plugins to start, we definitely used Jetpack for our custom CSS, which was great. Um, and we also used some other plugins, which I have listed here. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about a few and not go through the whole list. One of the things that was important to us being a federal website was that um, the external links on our website were very clearly identified. And so we used the Better WordPress external links plugin to help us out with that. Um, some more plugins that we used, we used the Expander plugin. Uh, which was great because it allowed us to include a lot of content on our pages, um, but we were able to condense that with the Expander plugin and let the users click on the button to show the additional case studies and resources if they chose to do that. Um, and we also used the Members plugin, and that was important for controlling access permissions for all the people that were involved in the project. Um, and so I think I ended, we ended up using about 15 plugins total. We were also luckily able to utilize a number of other federal programs and resources, which I think was a huge benefit since we had a very constrained timeline and no money to spend. We used the federal mobile testing group to help us find mobile testers and review the site on mobile devices. Uh, we also used the Health and Human Services Usability Lab to help us with usability testing. We used the digital analytics platform and the digital gov search program. So if you're interested in learning more about any of those, you can visit the digitalgov.gov website. And as far as team tools, uh, we used Photoshop and Illustrator for design work. Um, Chrome DevTools got a lot of action uh, when I was trying to style the theme and figure out you know, what classes were already being used and how I could change them. Um, but I think the most valuable tool that we used was Slack for team communication. It was especially great for the designer and I to go back and forth when we were working on a page. We could have a conversation about what we wanted to do. Um, she could tell me kind of her thoughts. I could mock something up and send it back right away. And, and the entire conversation was then saved in Slack. And so I think um, that was a really great tool for us to use, especially being remote. Um, I was in Ohio and she was in Colorado. Um, so, Obviously working in multi-site, one of the challenges we had was not being able to write any backend code. Um, but something that made that issue a little worse for us was that several folks had never used WordPress before. Um, and there were a couple who had never even worked on a web project. So they didn't really get why we couldn't implement some of the features they've seen on other websites. Um, so one lesson I took away from that was to really put in more effort in the beginning to better explain the differences um, between front end and back end um, and server side code um, and how multi-site works and what it can and cannot do. Another challenge we had, like I mentioned, was working on the distributed team. Some folks were in DC and were able to get together in person, but there were some folks like myself uh, who were completely remote. Um, and my thoughts here that are if you are working on a mixed remote team like I did, um, I think it's better to do all your meetings and get togethers online. One problem we had was the DC folks would get together and then the remote folks would dial into the conference line. And so when you do something like that, the folks who are remote kind of get treated sometimes as a second class citizen. Maybe you're not able to really get your point across or um, aren't able to answer all the questions that you want. Um, so again, my recommendation is maybe just take it all online if you can, so that folks who are distributed kind of have an equal chance at communication. 
Uh, one of the things I also would love to be able to do in multi-site, looking at all of you, um, is to be able to edit the custom CSS outside of the admin interface so that we can, you know, set up a super cool local dev environment and be able to use some other great build tools that are out there. And I think that would just make it a little easier. So we launched the Citizen Science and Crowdsourcing Toolkit on the whitehouse.gov live stream, which was really cool. Um, and we did that, like I said, at the end of September this year. And that fulfilled our first half of the commitment for the Open Innovation Toolkit. So next up, we're working on the other half of that commitment, which is the Challenges and Prizes Toolkit. And we expect to launch that early next year. It also is utilizing uh, the Open Opportunities platform to find volunteers. It is utilizing WordPress multi-site. Um, one of the advantages with this site will be, though, that challenge.gov um, is its own program. So there may be a little bit of funding and budgeting there. So we might be able to do a little bit more fun things. Um, and if you want to follow along with the progress on that site, you can check out ChallengeGov on Twitter for updates. So finally, I just wanted to finish up and talk about some of the other WordPress sites that are out there in government. Um, some of these you may have heard of and a couple I mentioned already. The first one is data.gov and it is running WordPress and they actually open source the code. So you can go out to GitHub and check that out. It's available for y'all to look at. Um, also CIO.gov, um, the digitalgov.gov site I mentioned is running WordPress. And like I said, Sites is our multi-site platform where any federal agency can come and get a WordPress site without any additional cost. I, I think that's great. So that's all I had today. Thank you. Any questions? I'm just curious if the opportunities to volunteer are open to anyone or if that's just open to federal employees. Yeah, unfortunately, it's just open to federal employees. Could you detail a few more of the multi-site problems that you uh, had? Maybe even ones that you couldn't get past, just out of interest, because I've used multi-site quite a bit, mm -hmm. and I know it can be frustrating. So uh, I was wondering maybe if there's any advice that I could catch you with later on. Um, one of the things I ran into was I kind of ended up solving the same problems over and over again in different ways, because um, the theme, for example, didn't show the case study overview page um, exactly how the leadership wanted it when we developed it. So I redesigned it. And that was great, but you know, we had text overlapping the image. So we redesigned it. And each time, being so limited with what we could do, I had to just crank through all the plugins to see you know, what's available to me and just literally solve the same problem. I think I redesigned the um, case study overview page. I rewrote it like four or five times. Um, and another challenge we had with the plugins was that uh, we were limited to using the specific approved version of the plugin that the sites team had installed. So one issue I had with, with that was I wanted to use Flexbox on our site, but because the Jetpack plugin wasn't current and up to date, um, it was an old issue where I couldn't use Flexbox. It, it wasn't letting me put in like the fallbacks. Um, so I actually had to strip all that out. And um, I asked the sites team to update that. But because they're going through the accessibility and the security reviews, um, it actually didn't even get updated in time for me to use it. So you know, one thing that's one thing I would say if you're running a multi-site install yourself, 
Um, having those plugins updated, I think is really great. I had another issue where a plugin wasn't updated, so I was having a problem, um, but the newer version of the plugin solved that problem. Um, that one, fortunately, we were able to get installed right away, so it was fixing my issue. But if you're running a multi-site, um, I think reviewing those plugins and make sure you're keeping them updated is really important. If, this, uh, if your information will be available somewhere, it would be good to see all those plugins that you used again. Yeah, I'm going to be posting this, and I'll tweet it out on the WCUS uh, Twitter hashtag. Um, I guess I could also post it in the WCUS Slack channel if anybody's interested in that. Okay, any other questions? All right, thanks very much. Enjoy your lunch.